Do they, uh, is the person need medical attention? Uh, I don't know. They're getting them out of the car right now. Oh, they got kids and everything in the car. I don't know if it's on fire or, or there's other people that um, are helping the people. That is a 911 call with a female's voice and also the voice of George Zimmerman. And you have not heard this call before. It has nothing to do with Trayvon Martin. George Zimmerman's voice not in the call, but the man and woman talking about an incident involving George Zimmerman. This isn't about Trayvon Martin. Again, I repeat, repeat that. Four days after the acquittal, George Zimmerman happened on an accident scene, we are told, people in an overturned SUV. It happened Wednesday evening in Sanford, the same community where Trayvon Martin was shot and killed by George Zimmerman. Zimmerman did not see the crash, but we had assumed he'd be staying out of the public eye and if he was in Sanford at all. And it turns out he was there and wound up assisting at the scene and talked to deputies. This, again, just days after news of the acquittal. Joining me now uh, exclusively here on Piers Morgan Live to discuss the situation, Mr. Zimmerman's attorney, Mark O'Mara. Mark, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, Anything I sure said thing, so Chris, far uh, is wrong. That 911 call is about the incident. George was not on the call, but he was at the scene of the crash, did assist, and this in the same area That's where correct. everything else happened. True? Yeah, very strange. I mean, this is quintessential George. This is the person who I knew him to be when I found out about his past before February 12th. Just the guy who always involved in the community, always willing to you know, lend a helping hand. And here we go, four days after the event, something that I could not have planned, but turned out to be just pure George. Now, is it true that you saw George soon after this incident and he did not mention it to you? Is that true? We had conversations over the last few days, um, and yes, he came by, um, but did not mention this at all. Again, to him, this is who he is and who he's always been, so it's not unusual, I guess, for him. I was surprised. I'm not sure that I would have, you know, gone out and, and got in public like he did four days after the acquittal, but he certainly did. Well, that's an interesting point that you raise, uh, Mark. What is his plan? Do you believe he is safe there in Sanford? Well, um, that was only a few days after he was trying to make some plans to decide what to do. Of course, he was sort of surprised, if you would, at, at the blowback to the verdict. He thought that finally America had gotten a chance to hear all of the facts about the case and to hear the whole trial, and that they would understand what really happened that night and that it was truly self-defense. And to hear a lot of the anger that has come since the verdict has surprised him. So he has taken some time away and just going to sort of relax and stay out of the public eye. And I'm not trying to be provocative. I mean, you, you have said and uh, we've heard through the family that there have been meaningful threats against his safety, yes? Yes, there have been. Actually, there was a, a, an increase in them since the verdict came back. Again, sort of a surprise and which ch chagrined by it, but I understand that there's a lot of emotions wrapped around the case and they still seem to be focused on George rather than on the issues they should be. Well, let's talk about that uh, distinction in your mind between what they should be sure. on and what they are on. What is your take on the outrage that's there specifically, not outrage, but reaction, President Obama and his comments? What have you thought about all this? Well, you know, if you look at just the sound bite, I think it was it was inappropriate to suggest that 35 years ago he could have Trayvon could have been him or whatever. But if you look at the complete context of what the president said, I think what he was acknowledging was that we still do have some issues of race and the way there is a divide between the country still, and it's a conversation that we need to have. And you may recall, Chris, we talked a couple of weeks ago, and I've talked to peers in the past. I've done for 30 years criminal defense where I've represented young black males in the system and they, there is an issue that needs to be addressed. My frustration has always been that we're using the George Zimmerman case as the focus point for that when this was not a racial event. George was more probably a non-racist than most people, yet they've decided to focus on George for their hatred when actually the anger is properly placed on the system having nothing to do with George. Well. Just address what you know already, which is what the basis of dissatisfaction is with the verdict, which is that a young black man doing nothing wrong winds up dead and there is no responsibility under the law. It seems just wrong, and you acknowledge that, but you have an explanation, which is? The reality is, is that what George did was not just legally correct. 
but was appropriate for the situation that he was in. It's very easy to Monday morning quarterback and say, well, if only he didn't get out of the car. Well, maybe he didn't follow precisely the directions of law enforcement. But the reality is it came out at trial was that there are two people involved, and though one was 17, 17 is still old enough to have a responsibility for your actions. And Trayvon Martin decided for whatever reason with four minutes to move and to leave, decided to come back. And we know from the testimony of Ms. Gentel that he re-engaged the conversation at the very least. We also know that George did not land a blow and that he was struck many times in the face and then to concrete. And though whenever I say this, it looks like I'm just trashing, if you will, a 17-year-old who has passed, we, I don't know why we feel the need to ignore the factual reality of happened that night. If people accepted that factual reality, they could not and would not be as upset with George. If we then want to talk about the fact that maybe Trayvon and many other black males are looked at a certain way within the criminal justice system, did, did Sanford look at it a different way? Did the system look at it a different way? That's a conversation we could have, but nobody can look at the facts that came out of that trial and say this was 100% George's responsibility, because the reality is it just wasn't. So let me, under the law at least, let me uh, let you go, but with one quick question. I know you don't believe that the federal charges, that investigation will come to anything where George Zimmerman is involved, but do you think that this case is a legitimate starting off point for discussions about concealed weapon laws and stand your ground? Well, again, this is not a stand your ground case, never was. So I don't know that the facts of this could apply to stand your ground. But now that we're talking about stand your ground and, and weapons laws and the way the system may be skewed, I think it's great to have those conversations. Mm -hmm. Even if George Zimmerman case may not have been the appropriate case for the starting point because of the facts, the, the conversations can still be had. You know, we may look at the stand your ground law and say, should it be polished? in such a way where people still accept the responsibility to try and retreat, mm -hmm. to try and move out of an area of danger rather than just know that you don't need to. Mm. Certainly something we should look at. Mark O'Mara, thank you very much. Appreciate it. And you'd be surprised how many people think the verdict did hinge on stand your ground. So it's always important to hear your take on that. Thank you for joining sure. Piers Morgan Live tonight. Great, Chris.